Welcome, everybody. Um, we're excited to have everybody uh, joining us this evening. Um, so we'd like to welcome you to the CAA's uh, virtual faculty program featuring SEPA professor and former Phil uh, mayor of Philadelphia, Michael Nutter. Um, we're excited to be joined by our regional clubs across Atlanta, Dallas, and Minnesota. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly um, show everybody the rooms. We have um, Steve at Atlanta and the whole group. Hello, Atlanta. Hello. Um, we've got Dallas. Hi. Hi, Dallas. <laughs> um, and we have Minnesota. Hello, Minnesota. It's great to see everybody. Um, so before we get started, um, we'll just do a very quick uh, housekeeping notes um, to give everybody a sense of the run of show for this evening. Um, so we're starting right now, it's a little after 7.45. We'll begin with a brief introduction from our leader, Tanya, in Dallas. Um, and we ask all of the leaders to uh, distribute all of the index cards for the Q&A uh, section of the evening. Um, in just a moment, we'll, uh, Mayor Nutter will begin his presentation. Um, and at 8.10, we would ask the leaders to begin collecting those questions from the audience, which will lead right into the Q&A. Um, at 8.35, we will do uh, closing remarks led by Stephen in Atlanta, and the program will officially end at 8.45. Um, so again, thank you all for joining this evening. We're excited to have you. Um, live from New York, it is Thursday night, um, and I'll turn it over now to Tanya in Dallas. Hi, Tanya. Thank you, Sarah. Greetings from Dallas, Fort Worth. We'd like to thank all of you for attending this event and welcome Mayor Nutter, Professor of Professional Practice in Urban and Public Affairs, who will be speaking on his experience in U.S. politics this evening. This topic falls under the Just Society season of the Columbia Commitment Campaign. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Nutter. Well, Tanya, thank you uh, very, very much. And uh, certainly Sarah and the entire team. Uh, this is, uh, as I understand it, a, a bit of a first time experience. Uh, and I'm just honored uh, to, uh, to have been picked uh, to uh, participate. Uh, I would take it that uh, things can only get better uh, from, uh, from this one. Uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to an exciting, uh, dynamic conversation. I uh, also want to thank uh, just the great folks here at SEPA. Uh, you know, being the inaugural David N. Dinkins Professor of Practice uh, is just an incredible honor. Uh, love uh, Mayor Dinkins and uh, working with him and uh, appreciating and better understanding uh, his uh, leadership of uh, this, uh, this great city. I thought for a moment Sarah was gonna do her, uh, sounded almost like a Saturday Night Live uh, introduction. Uh, I was wondering how she was gonna handle the fact that it was Thursday night, uh, but uh, she did, a, uh, did an excellent job. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that I'd uh, certainly like to talk about, and I know we have a Q&A, uh, but uh, leadership is a pretty lonely uh, position uh, at times, and leaders also have to figure out uh, how to put the right people in the right places, uh, what's your you know, focus, uh, what's your, the theme of your administration, uh, what are the things that you care about. And one of the things uh, that I cared about greatly uh, during my time as mayor and even before uh, having served 14 and a half years in Philadelphia City Council uh, was always about the issue of public safety. Uh, when I came into office in January of 2008, having run in uh, the primary and the general, in 2007, one of the leading issues uh, in our great city uh, was unfortunately uh, the high level of violence, uh, 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 and in particular, uh, gun violence. Uh, and so uh, from day one, we were very, very focused uh, on this issue. I was fortunate that I was able to hire uh, Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey, uh, who during the course of his tenure, uh, it became clear, uh, and as nominated many times by his peers, uh, that he was, in fact, the best police commissioner uh, in the United States of America, and we were fortunate uh, to have him. We got along very, very well. Uh, we set some significant goals uh, for uh, our time and for the administration, for the city, 
uh, which I announced uh, right from the stage uh, on the first day at the inauguration. Uh, you know, we know from uh, whatever school you might be in, uh, I think this one uh, still holds true, uh, that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, and uh, if you don't set goals, uh, then you have nothing to kind of compare uh, what's, what does success uh, look like. And so uh, one thing I learned from a former mayor of this uh, great city uh, here in New York, uh, former Mayor Bloomberg, was that you can't have a great city if people don't feel safe. Uh, and uh, that is still certainly true. Uh, and I wanted to focus our administration uh, on the issue of public safety, making sure that kids, uh, school-aged children, adults, our senior citizens could, you know, for the most part, walk down the street uh, and not be fearful uh, that uh, they might be, you know, shot or killed or mugged or uh, any other, uh, you know, negative negative experience that uh, that you might have. And so, on that first day, uh, set out some goals. We wanted to uh, reduce uh, homicides by 30 to 50 percent. Uh, and have significant reductions in all other uh, major crimes uh, in our city. Uh, declared a crime emergency uh, on the first day, about an hour or so after being sworn in uh, as the 98th mayor of Philadelphia. Uh, and we uh, got to work and we got, uh, as we might say, we got busy uh, very, very quickly. Uh, the commissioner, I think, re-inspired uh, the uh, brave men and women who wear the uniform uh, on a daily basis and try to try their best to make sure we're safe. Uh, they were getting, uh, Commissioner got them, uh, in many instances, out of their cars, walking beats. Uh, we used data and uh, information. We had a partnership uh, at the time with Temple University uh, and uh, uh, really analyzed uh, what's going on uh, in our city, every street, every block, every neighborhood. Uh, we found that 65% uh, of the homicides in the city the previous year uh, we're actually committed in nine of our tw then 23 uh, police districts. And so that brought about a restructuring uh, to some extent, a redeployment, if you will, of the police department. Uh, we uh, put more officers, obviously, where there were uh, crimes taking place, uh, but not at the expense of other areas uh, that, uh, you know, at least statistically, were safer. And so, again, that's a balancing act. How do you make sure uh, that uh, you're bringing the proper resources to an issue. But at the same time, uh, you don't want to exacerbate uh, a situation or create uh, a new problem uh, in places where you didn't have a problem before. And so, again, smart policing uh, made uh, all the difference. Uh, we brought technology in, uh, outdoor video surveillance cameras, tech, uh, text tip hotlines, uh, rewards for people who uh, shot or killed. Uh, a fellow Philadelphian. Uh, these were some of the strategies uh, that, uh, that we used. Uh, we emphasized at every possible opportunity uh, our focus on public safety. Uh, we held any number of community meetings. Uh, if there were uh, an horrific crime or something like that, I spoke out about it. The police commissioner spoke out about it. And we just wanted people to have a certain sense of outrage uh, about uh, violence taking place, but also a sense of urgency about making sure that things were different uh, and that people could walk down the street. And uh, the end result is, uh, over the eight-year period of time, again, uh, I said on the first day, we needed a 30 to 50 percent reduction in homicides uh, in about uh, five to six years. Uh, by the end of our administration, eight years in total, uh, we actually had nearly a 32 percent reduction in homicides. Uh, there are some people uh, young people, uh, and in this instance, it's mostly uh, young black men, young uh, men of color. Uh, there are some people alive in Philadelphia today uh, because of uh, many of the efforts of our police commissioner uh, and, again, the brave men and women of the Philadelphia Police Department. That's an incredible feeling uh, to be in public service. Uh, I loved uh, being in service uh, during my time. Uh, but the impact that you can have on someone else's life uh, it's just an incredible feeling uh, and knowing that you have that chance uh, each and every day, 24 hours in a day, and you did your best today and you get another opportunity when, uh, when you get up and go to work uh, the next day. And that's really what I loved about public service, setting goals, getting stuff done, making things happen, uh, having an impact uh, that you can, especially in local government. Local government touches people uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, it, 
probably in so many ways uh, that we actually take a lot of things uh, for granted. You get up in the morning, you have a reasonable expectation that, uh, you know, clean, good water is going to come out of the faucet. And, you know, for the most part, it does. Uh, you walk out in the street, you expect the traffic signals to work, you'd like the roads to be in a decent condition so you don't, you know, blow out a tire or kill an axle or something like that. Uh, these, that's the government uh, in your life on a daily basis. And, you know, to the three clubs, uh, wherever you may be, the same thing is going on, whether it's in Minnesota or Atlanta uh, and Dallas, uh, the local government uh, is uh, actively engaged uh, uh, in your life, uh, whether directly or indirectly. Uh, and again, sometimes we take uh, all those things for granted. Uh, being at SEPA, uh, working you know, with and at times under the uh, leadership uh, of uh, Mayor Dinkins and certainly uh, our Dean, uh, Dean Marajano, uh, is an incredible opportunity uh, now in a post-mayoral uh, life to uh, share insights, share information, try to provide uh, some leadership uh, to, uh, to my students uh, at, uh, at SEPA. Uh, quite honestly, in a post-mayoral environment, I am having a ball uh, and uh, very pleased and very proud uh, to have this kind of relationship uh, with uh, Columbia University and certainly SEPA. Uh, my daughter is a uh, uh, Columbia uh, undergrad uh, graduate, uh, now working in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill, uh, graduated in uh, 2017. She was actively involved uh, in my campaign along with uh, along with my wife. Today's actually my our daughter's uh, birthday, uh, and uh, you know it's um, it's a wonderful moment. Uh, things have changed uh, certainly a lot uh, in the last uh, eight, nine, ten years. A very, very different uh, political climate. But I know uh, that many of my students, at least, and and tons of others uh, here at uh, Columbia and at SEPA are still thinking about public service, uh, still want to serve, still want to give back uh, to the community, still want to make an impact uh, on uh, people's lives. And I could not be more thrilled. Uh, I want to encourage uh, any of you uh, who are at the uh, three clubs, uh, if you still have the opportunity uh, to go into public service, think about it. It may not be for everyone. Uh, you won't make a lot of money. Uh, and uh, most people who try to make money, make a lot of money in, in public service, usually go to jail. Uh, so, uh, but there's a, a value uh, to uh, that service. Uh, you might not be able to spend it at the supermarket, uh, but uh, it's a value uh, nonetheless uh, that uh, you gave everything you had and uh, helped improve uh, the lives of your fellow citizens. So I think maybe uh, with that, uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, get a, uh, a dialogue going. Uh, you didn't uh, come to those three places just uh, to hear me talk, and there are any number of issues I'm sure uh, that many of you uh, would like to uh, like to talk about, uh, get a dialogue going. So, uh, Sarah, I'm going to throw it back uh, to you, uh, and uh, let's uh, let's hear from uh, the Columbia alumni. Great, thank you, Mayor Nutter. Um, I think you did a fantastic job of. Uh, you know, kind of stating the, the benefits of public service. Um, you said setting goals, getting things done, um, and making an impact. And I think that's something that no matter where you are across the U.S. or even the globe, um, you know, many of, of Columbia's alumni can relate to the, uh, those concepts and that sentiment. So um, thank you I, I, again for the fantastic presentation. I hope everybody um, got some great takeaways from that. Um, so I'm just going to ask the leaders to begin collecting um, the questions from the audience, whether you're doing that with index cards or um, through another format, now would be the time to do that. Um, in terms of taking questions, we'll go um, one by one from Atlanta to begin and then Dallas and then Minnesota, just to keep everything um, a bit streamlined. Um, so, uh, just to start off, we'll turn it over to Atlanta. Fantastic. Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Netter, thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate. Uh, we have several questions. The first one comes from Nathan Ladd. And Nathan writes, often in modern political times, we hear about the pendulum swinging from one end to another. Do you consider the US and perhaps European countries exhibiting 
the phenomenon of the pendulum swinging and where will it go in the next five years, sir? Well, I wish it, uh, there are some days I wish I knew where it was going, you know, in the next five minutes or five days, uh, let alone uh, five years. I, I think we are at an unusual time, uh, not just in the United States, but as the question uh, is stated, uh, around the world. Uh, you know, prior to the 2016 election, of course, we had uh, the decision uh, by uh, uh, the folks in uh, Great Britain uh, to leave uh, the European Union, now, of course, known as uh, Brexit. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure many of us here in America thought, you know, well, that's a little strange. Uh, and what is that all about? Uh, and then, uh, you know, the 2016 election took place, uh, you know, I should say it up front. I think many people know that I'm a Democrat, so I was actively involved on the Democratic side. And so for many of us, uh, certainly a big surprise uh, in the 2016 election. And that felt like uh, the pendulum uh, was uh, still uh, moving to the right. I, you know, I think over time, uh, just to kind of keep that analogy going, you know, the pendulum is, is uh, you know, it should be. Uh, pretty much constantly in motion. It's going back and forth. Uh, but uh, this, this is a different kind of time, the rise of uh, populism, uh, in some places, the rise of nationalism. Uh, people are angry, they're frustrated, uh, they're fearful. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've seen uh, in our past, certainly here in America, that uh, sometimes uh, people in public office or those aspiring to public office will uh, prey on the, the, the fears uh, and uh, the, uh, the language we use sometimes is the othering uh, of uh, certain groups and, and people identifying uh, or targeting a group as, uh, you know, they're the problem and as soon as they're not here anymore, whoever they are, uh, you know, your, your life will get better, your problems uh, will go away. Uh, for the most part, of course, we know that's not true, uh, but it is a very powerful, uh, I would suggest powerfully negative uh, political tool uh, that, is, uh, that is often used. I think uh, lastly here in the States, we saw uh, at least some of that pendulum swing uh, back, uh, Democrats taking over the House, uh, the citizens expressing tremendous amount of frustration and discomfort. Uh, with, uh, in some instances, the direction of our uh, federal government and the leadership uh, presently in place. And so, you know, the main thing is, is that people come out and vote. Uh, you know, if you have something on your mind, if you're angry about something, if you want change, uh, you have to participate in the process. Democracy is a participatory activity. Uh, and, uh, you know, voting, uh, for me at least, is an essential component of good citizenship. Great, I hope that answered the question in Atlanta. Um, so we'll move on now to Dallas for your first question. Thank you. Mayor Nutter, what is your outlook on the 2020 election? Uh, big field, uh, certainly for, uh, for Democrats and uh, seemingly growing uh, every other week. Um, you know, I, I think that's part of the strength, uh, quite frankly, of the party is that we have uh, such a, uh, you know, I guess we'll, uh, maybe move into sports analogies now. I mean, we have such a deep bench. Uh, we have such a level of quality uh, for uh, so many people, uh, A, to be inspired to even think about running uh, for president of the United States, let alone actually announcing uh, that, uh, that intention. Uh, I think we're seeing a generational shift uh, to some extent. Uh, we've got a, a rise of a number of younger uh, candidates uh, and certainly those who are more veteran uh, uh, running uh, as well. Uh, I think 2020 is going to be an interesting and dynamic year, uh, maybe more than interesting. It's going to probably be a pretty wild ride. Uh, you know, we have a quite unusual person uh, who is the president, uh, president occupant uh, of the White House. Uh, we've got some uh, dynamic and uh, experienced uh, candidates uh, on the Democratic side running. Uh, and so, uh, and I think we still have a few folks uh, who probably have not yet uh, announced. And so uh, what I'm really waiting to see is when we have a full field, uh, and then it's going to be fascinating to see how 
uh, TV and community groups and others uh, deal with the prospect of, you know, possibly a dozen uh, serious people running for president of the United States of America. Thank you, Mayonetta. Certainly um, quite a few factors to anticipate um, in the coming year or so. Um, so now with that, we'll move on to Minnesota for their first round of questions. <laughs> Describe an instance when local government worked effectively with state or federal authorities. What was the catalyst for making it work? Sure. Um, well, there were certainly a number of uh, instances, uh, but um, you know, I, th I think uh, I'll talk about one that was very, very public. Uh, the public could see uh, exactly what uh, those uh, three levels, if you will, of government uh, were doing. Um, at the tail end of my tenure, uh, there was a most uh, uh, tragic uh, train derailment, uh, Amtrak 188, uh, coming out of Philadelphia on its way to New York. Uh, the train uh, derailed, uh, 243 passengers, and unfortunately eight uh, people died, uh, and a number of folks were uh, significantly injured uh, in, um, in that train derailment. And uh, from day one, uh, the city, the state, the federal government, and a variety of agencies like uh, National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, the Federal Railway Administration, FRA, uh, the governor uh, of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, state police, Amtrak, Philly police, Philly fire. Uh, there were a lot of uh, people and, and, and personnel and agencies uh, actively involved in A, uh, first and foremost, the rescue uh, operation. Uh, when that tragedy happened, we didn't even really know what had happened other than the train went off the tracks. We didn't know if uh, it was an act of terrorism. We didn't know if there was... Uh, you know, possible uh, explosion or something else. Uh, and the very brave men and women of the Philadelphia Police Department and Fire Department were first on the scene uh, and uh, uh, literally jumped right into action, uh, having no idea whether or not they were even safe, uh, but their focus was uh, on saving lives. And I think that night they certainly did uh, save lives. Again, unfortunately, eight people did uh, perish uh, in that tragedy. Um, that night, uh, Governor Wolf uh, came to Philadelphia uh, from, uh, uh, from his home uh, and stood with us, uh, as well as a number of other uh, agencies and departments, uh, literally for that first press conference, which I think was around 12 midnight or 1 a.m., uh, or something like that, uh, but already demonstrating that the city and the state were on the same page. NTSB uh, arrived in Philadelphia the next day. Uh, and uh, all three of us, local, state, and federal, uh, worked hand in hand uh, to A, uh, try to make sure the maximum number of people uh, would survive uh, uh, such a horrific uh, uh, situation. Uh, what happened? How did it happen? How do you rebuild? Uh, and uh, keep all those teams together. And we uh, set up uh, kind of a command operation. Uh, and on a daily basis, every day that following week, uh, uh, we uh, talked with each other, figured out what the message of the day is, uh, stayed together, didn't, you know, no finger pointing, no backstabbing. Uh, and it, it was an incredible experience, uh, certainly under uh, very difficult circumstances. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for your, your fantastic questions so far, and Mayor Netter for your very informative responses. Um, well, we have um, a good amount of time left, so we'll start through um, our second round of questions. Um, Atlanta, we'll turn it straight over to you. Fantastic. This question, Professor Nutter, is from Pedro. He wants to know, did the Super Bowl win of 2017, in which New England beat Atlanta in the final overtime, 34 to 28, as you know, sir, did that Super Bowl win have any effect on public safety in the city and the immediate aftermath? 
I assume you're talking about the Super Bowl, the Eagles winning the uh, Super Bowl? Is that I apologize. Uh, Philadelphia versus Atlanta. I, I apologize. <laughs> time I'm going to correct myself. Uh, in the Super Bowl. Um, you know, uh, I think all in all, uh, I mean, you know, that night, of course, I mean, the city went uh, slightly crazy. Um, and, uh, you know, there were some public safety challenges. Uh, the Philadelphians uh, apparently have this thing uh, when, you know, big events or big, huge celebrations, they apparently like to climb our light poles. Uh, and so uh, Philadelphia Police Department and public property, uh, we actually have developed the, uh, a certain solution uh, that we spray, uh, the, uh, spray the poles with to try to, you know, keep down literally. Uh, the number of people trying to climb up, uh, climb up telephone poles. Um, and, and I'm sure there were a few arrests uh, here and there, but for the most part, uh, under the circumstances, I mean, we hadn't, you know, been an NFL champion in about 50 years. Uh, people were fairly well behaved. They were very excited, uh, pretty noisy. Uh, and that went on for a good while, but uh, all in all, it was, uh, it was fine. Great. Thank you, Mayor Nutter. And uh, Atlanta bringing some levity to the conversation with um, some Super Bowl, Super Bowl talk. Um, we'll open it up to Dallas again for question number two. Thank you. Education is a fundamental institution. Have you encouraged redistribution of resources to underfunded school districts using a similar data-driven decision-making process in Philadelphia, working with current Mayor Kenneth, Kenny? So a couple things on that. Um, you know, I had the unfortunate experience of being mayor during the, uh, during the Great Recession. And uh, we had a, a, the previous governor to the current governor. Uh, uh, he had a, how would I say this, uh, maybe a slightly different uh, philosophy uh, with regard to public education. And so, you know, the recession was devastating enough in and of itself. Uh, and then it was uh, for the education community and our children further exacerbated by the fact that the state made significant cuts uh, in education uh, and uh, simultaneously because of those cuts uh, I was in a position uh, you know at the time the mayor was not in charge of public education but I took the position that these are my children these are our children I pick up their parents trash I should actually have something to say about what goes on uh, in the public education system. Uh, and so the state was cutting uh, funding to uh, uh, educate our children. And I was raising people's taxes uh, to, uh, to make up for the shortfall. I think we raised taxes at least four times or, or found new taxes uh, to, uh, to generate money. Uh, didn't make me particularly popular, uh, but you know, public service is really not about pop popularity. In, in my view, it's about service. Uh, and uh, trying to improve the quality of life. And that was, uh, I felt, was my duty and my responsibility. Uh, so we did shift resources. We sent nearly uh, an additional $400 million of new annually recurring uh, funding uh, to public education during my time. Uh, we also increased, uh, we saw a pretty significant increase in the high school graduation rate, uh, which was another goal that I announced uh, at my first inauguration, it was 53% uh, uh, of our students were graduating in four years. When I came into office, when I left, uh, that number was 68%. Uh, I wanted a higher number, and that's what I stated. But again, we at least had a goal that we were driving to. So, um, you know, the uh, our, our current mayor uh, in uh, Philadelphia uh, has uh, uh, put forward any number of uh, ideas and proposals. Uh, the primary one uh, is around uh, uh, increasing the number of high quality pre-K slots uh, to, uh, to make sure that our children get off uh, to a really good start uh, as they embark upon their uh, educational career. And uh, I know uh, the mayor has been particularly focused in, uh, in that area. A great question from Dallas. Um, obviously, education is uh, a topic near and dear to all of our hearts here as um, Columbia staff and graduates and um, faculty. Um, so we'll take our, um, our, our next question from Minnesota. 
Do you think this country will elect a woman for president anytime soon, or are there too many people who just can't go that far? I am hopeful uh, I that um, in <laughs> in my lifetime. Uh, I mean, I'm not that old, but I'm not I'm not that young, I guess. Um, unless unless sixty is the new forty. Um, but yes, I think there will be a woman president. Uh, you know, so many of us. Uh, for so many, many years, uh, wondered uh, if there would ever be, you know, an African-American elected president of the United States of America. I think our society continues to change, continues to evolve. Uh, we see, uh, you know, we've seen this dramatic increase in the number of women in Congress, uh, the largest number in uh, American history. Uh, we're seeing uh, more and more women running for president of the United States of America. And I think it, it, I think we are on a path of inevitability, uh, but even with that, uh, we can't take anything for granted. We have to be intentional. Uh, I think it is very important uh, for the nation uh, that uh, uh, soon uh, that a woman is elected uh, president of the United States of America. I don't know if it will be 2020 or not. I, I don't think any of us know uh, what 2020 is ultimately gonna be about. Uh, but uh, it, it just should not be, you know, a, a foreign uh, uh, idea uh, to, uh, to, to anyone uh, here in the United States of America. And I think, uh, you know, on that particular point, uh, some of us, some people uh, need, to, uh, need to really grow up uh, and recognize that leadership comes in, you know, all, uh, all genders, all ages, all races, uh, and uh, that uh, you're capacity and your capability and the qualities uh, that uh, are needed uh, can be within anyone. Great. Um, fantastic message. Um, so we have uh, time for one more round of questions. Um, so once again, we'll start with Atlanta um, for the final round. Fantastic. Thank you. Professor Nutter, this question comes from Gonzalo, who did an executive MBA at Columbia. He wants to know how to balance great police work with a judiciary that is very lenient, that sends repeat offenders to the streets. Well, uh, you know, I guess the first part of that challenge is, uh, in most instances, the police department, of course, is uh, usually situated within the uh, executive branch of government. Uh, and, you know, I think as we all know from, you know, probably, uh, you know, fourth grade civics or something, uh, you know, we have the th three separate independent branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. Uh, and so, you know, the police department uh, can't tell the courts, uh, the judges, what to do, nor can the judges tell uh, uh, police uh, what to do. I think that uh, uh, what we need is a, a watchful public and press uh, using data, uh, using evidence, uh, using information uh, that uh, when these instances uh, occur, uh, that we have the data and the facts uh, to, uh, to back it up uh, and have people understand that, uh, you know, the critical decisions that judges make, uh, not that we're trying to second guess anyone, but, you know, if uh, you know, someone is let go or gets a very light sentence and then goes out and commits another crime, uh, you know, you've just, you know, damaged someone else's family. So, uh, but I think uh, these organizations like Court Watch and, and, and uh, many of the others uh, have to get that data and information out uh, to let the public know what decisions the judges are making. Uh, and, you know, obviously a case by case basis and hindsight uh, naturally is 2020 vision but in some instances uh, you know reading through someone's case file I mean you can probably uh, with reasonable accuracy uh, probably figure out whether or not someone is going to uh, do another crime or you know recidivate thank you Atlanta and uh, Mayor Nutter uh, moving back over to Dallas thanks Mayor Nutter, have you seen a city or cities successfully handle and avoid the displacement of neighborhood residences when their neighborhood becomes gentrified? And what are your thoughts on that? Uh, 
I think most of our uh, cities, at least in America, uh, and any that are showing, you know, growth and economic vitality, I think almost every city in America is facing some level of challenge uh, with regard to uh, gentrification and uh, displacement. Uh, some, you know, more than likely are handling it uh, possibly better than some others, but it is a very difficult and challenging uh, issue. Uh, generally, you know, you want growth, you want expansion, you want uh, more uh, development. On the other hand, you have to be very, very careful uh, and balance uh, the desire and need uh, for growth with uh, stable uh, neighborhoods, uh, stable communities. Uh, and that uh, stabilizing force is often uh, the folks who have lived there the longest. Uh, they know the neighborhood history. They know the neighborhood, you know, kind of uh, social rules of engagement. Uh, they often set the standards uh, for, you know, acceptable uh, community uh, behavior. And uh, as, you know, my grandmother used to say, you know, you can be house rich and cash poor. Uh, the value of your home has nothing to do with your ability often to uh, pay your taxes. And so, uh, a variety of steps uh, can and should be taken. We did some of those things in Philadelphia during my time. We're, of course, a city uh, that was uh, growing and building, and, and uh, uh, we wanted to make sure that, uh, for instance, long-term owner, uh, owners uh, could stay in their homes, that seniors could stay in their homes. And so different programs and services were created. Uh, some had already been in existence but weren't uh, well-known or, or well-promoted, uh, and uh, we tried to let people know uh, that, A, this is an issue that we care about, B, uh, good uh, land use planning is critical uh, to uh, uh, dealing with these kinds of issues and dealing with movement and progress. Uh, you know, again, I've often said that every piece of ground doesn't have to have a building on it, and every old building is not historic. It's just old. Uh, and so, uh, again, uh, exciting and dynamic uh, documents like the zoning code uh, really do make a difference uh, in how uh, cities deal with growth and expansion and opportunity, while at the same time uh, maintaining community fabric uh, and the flavor, if you will, uh, of a particular neighborhood. And, um, and we will take now our last question uh, from Minnesota. Uh, first off, I just wanted to thank you. I thought this was a very good presentation. I appreciate your taking the time to speak with us uh, this evening. And thank you for to Columbia for making this technically possible for us. We have a lot of snow here, so it's nice to get out. So this is a two-part question. How are you able to successfully increase police presence in certain communities that have historically had negative relationships with the police? Do you think Philadelphia can serve as an example to other cities that have tension between certain communities and the police? Well, I think the well, first thing I would say is, uh, you know, I, I would be the first to acknowledge that, A, we didn't always get it right. B, uh, we had from time to time uh, some, you know, pretty uh, controversial uh, cases that uh, caused tension uh, between community and police and police and the community. Uh, but uh, a third, uh, I think that uh, we tried to demonstrate uh, that uh, our administration was sensitive uh, to uh, the nature of the relationship between uh, the community and the police, that uh, we had a zero tolerance for any kind of uh, abuse uh, or uh, uh, how officers might treat uh, uh, various individuals, so whether they've been arrested or not. Uh, and uh, I think the uh, final part is sensitizing and training and retraining our officers uh, to deal with issues of uh, implicit bias and, and prejudice, uh, if you will, uh, uh, thoughts about uh, people uh, that, you know, helping the officers understand that, you know, everyone who lives in a crime-ridden neighborhood is not a criminal, uh, that, uh, you know, some people like their neighborhood or, or they would like to move, but they can't, uh, whatever their life circumstance is, and they shouldn't have to. Uh, it's our responsibility to try uh, to get a good handle on uh, what's happening from a public safety uh, standpoint. So um, I think that um, leadership uh, on this particular issue, it really does start at the top. I, I had a role to play as mayor, uh, but uh, again, Police Commissioner Ramsey, I think his approach uh, made a big difference. Uh, if an officer got out of line, violated the rules, uh, they were fired. Uh, if 
uh, if we made a mistake uh, or you know did something that uh, further exacerbated the situation, we acknowledged it or we admitted it. Uh, and uh, but people also knew that we were focused on their safety uh, and uh, try to provide the citizens with a variety of tools uh, that could help us help them, if you will. Uh, we had regular uh, community meetings at police districts, uh, police district advisory councils we were very, very active, uh, you know, during, uh, during my time in office. And we wanted people to understand that, A, we were not going to uh, break the law to enforce the law. Uh, the commissioner talked to uh, the troops, if you will, all the time about, you know, treat people in the street the way you'd want your own family members uh, to, uh, to be treated. Uh, and I think that had, uh, I think that had an effect uh, in terms of uh, just how community engaged with the police. Uh, we had a high clearance rate. People knew uh, that if they reported something to us, uh, it would be done with discretion and safety, uh, and that there was a great likelihood uh, that the person would be caught uh, and then appropriately punished uh, by, um, you know, going through the uh, the legal uh, process. All of those factors and, and constant communication with the public, uh, I constantly emphasize uh, that we had to bring down uh, our shooting and, and, and homicide rates uh, while at the same time uh, making it easier for people to go about uh, their daily lives. And so it is a balancing act. It is tough. Uh, but uh, if you set your mind to it, if your team is right, if their intentions are good, uh, you can actually uh, make progress uh, in this particular area. Okay, excellent. Um, well, thank you again to Mayor Nutter and um, to all of you joining. Um, we've had a very engaging conversation um, around topics as diverse as public safety, um, education policy, uh, the move from the public service sector to teaching, um, gentrification, aligned leadership in difficult times, um, and even the Super Bowl win of the Eagles in uh, 2017. Um, so I hope that everyone will now be able to take this opportunity to um, network with your, your local community um, in Atlanta, Dallas, and Minnesota. Um, the evening is still young in some places, not so much in others. Um, but uh, with that, we will close out the evening um, and I'm going to turn it over to Stephen Carley in Atlanta. Thank you. Mayor Nutter, thank you for spending your time with us. I know you could have had other things you could have been doing with your time, but you spent it with us. We really do appreciate it. Growing up, sir, I had icons like Jack Ryan. I had icons like uh, Indiana Jones. They were good at multiple uh, and diverse um, backgrounds. Um, in the real world, we have names like Dwight David Eisenhower. He was a US Army general, and he was also president of Columbia. And we have names like David Petraeus. He um, was a US Army general, and he uh, taught at Georgetown and taught at other schools. Um, I would like to thank you, sir, for setting such a high standard in so many diverse fields. You're not only an Ivy League professor, but you're a former mayor. And both are ridiculously hard to do. I would be thrilled if I could do half of that. Uh, thank you again for setting such a phenomenal standard. I, I think I speak for all of us when I say we are all very impressed and we appreciate your time and what you've done and the standard you've set. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, thank you uh, very, very much. I mean, uh, um, to even be, I mean, it's, it, uh, to even be mentioned uh, in the same sentence as uh, some of the people that uh, that you mentioned, uh, um, you know, it's just incredible. I, I think that's part of my delayed uh, response. I, I just never imagined anything like that. Um, you know, I just always wanted to do a good job. I, I wanted to serve uh, my uh, community. Uh, that's the way I was raised and, and the values instilled in me by uh, you know both of my parents and my and my grandmother who I uh, grew up with uh, in in our home um, in a now in this post mayoral uh, world and environment I, I get to give back in a different way I get to serve in a different way uh, by being here at Columbia and so uh, this is for me is a continuation uh, of uh, the work from you know my time in city council to being mayor to to now being here at this incredible institution Columbia uh, university and the opportunity that they've given me uh, to uh, share with students. Uh, uh, I teach grad students, but you know, often 
uh, run into uh, undergrads as well. These young people are super sharp, they're super bright, uh, they're fun, they're engaging, uh, and they take, the, take things uh, very, very seriously in terms of what's going on in the world. They keep me young, uh, or help to anyway, uh, and uh, I'm always constantly learning uh, something new uh, from, uh, from the students. And so uh, to all of you as alums, A, uh, you also could be doing anything uh, anywhere else, especially the folks dealing with the snowstorm uh, in, uh, in Minnesota, uh, but you chose to spend a little time uh, with, uh, with us tonight. And I wanna say thank you uh, for your leadership, your commitment, uh, your acts of engagement, uh, and also uh, getting uh, the Columbia name uh, uh, spread out across the country and around the world. Uh, I am very proud uh, to be a part of uh, this family uh, at Columbia University. Okay, great. So thank you again, everybody. Um, have a great evening and um, please do keep in touch with um, the alumni office and your liaison. Um, we're, we're always happy to host you in any way that we can. Um, have a good evening. Thank you.